Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. Through the ages, there have been few heroes as adored as the medieval knight. With a prayer in his heart and a sword in his hand, it's easy to see why this ultimate warrior priest has stood the test of time. The warrior priest mindset unveils the inherent dual nature of every believer. Like Jesus, we must all be the lion and the lamb. Drawing on his own personal journey, playing the part of a knight, and being called to be set apart and be in a world, in the world, but not of the world, our next guest bridges the gap between being a warrior and a priest. Now a part of the Skywatch team, Drew Graffia met his wife Bree, who played the part of the damsel, while her knight Drew rescued, rescued her from the clutches of the Dark Knight. As their role playing became more supernatural than natural, the clear lines of Drew's calling to be both warrior and priest began to take on new meaning. Joining us now to talk about this journey is the author of The Warrior Priest Mindset, A Necessary Dichotomy for God's Chosen Knights, is Drew Graffia. Drew, welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Well, we're glad to have you here, and uh, congratulations on your new role at Skywatch. It's, uh, uh, for you, it's a dream come true uh, to align yourself with uh, an entire network of warrior priests who understand this concept, and uh, to uh, co-host with Josh Peck, and to get to know the entire team there at Skywatch is just uh, for somebody of your uh, 10 years of experience riding a horse, dressed in armor, to be able to be that uh, onward Christian soldier kind of model, but without the Jewish persecution aspect of it, <laughs> uh, it uh, really is a great fit. Take us back a little bit to uh, you as a young boy growing up with this dream in your heart to uh, be enamored with uh, playing with knights, with, with uh, uh, having this, this uh, childlike view of then a faith journey merging into fantasy, reality, the natural, the supernatural, and how all that comes together as an, a, uh, really an archetype for who we are called to be in the body of Messiah, but don't make the connection between the warrior and the priest. So where did it begin for you? Well, for me, it began very early on. When I was a young child, I was always fascinated by knights. I thought they were the ultimate hero. You know, they, they served a king that was greater than them. They were fearless in battle, but they were disciplined. Um, they just always fascinated me. and. I stuck with that theme growing up. I always would read night books, and eventually I heard about Medieval Times when I was when I was still in high school. I believe I went there on a trip, and I was just blown away. I was like, "Man, this is what I want to do." You know, you know, you have those dreams. You don't really know if they'll come true. You just have it, and then it's, you move on from it. But then um, it came time to leave high school. I just got out of high school, and I went and applied there. In about two years after high school, about 2008, I went and applied, and then I actually got the job, which I did not expect. And then once I got the job, it kind of made things more real. And I was like, wow, now, now I'm going to have to actually learn how to jump off a horse, how to ride a horse, you know, how to sword fight, all that stuff. But I, it, starting in 2008, I started to go through a journey of basically being crushed by the Lord. You know, I feel like my time ran out living in the world and it was time for me to make a choice. So as the Lord was working with me on that transition, I was also going through training from, to go from a squire to a knight. So to, to learn all these, these, like I said, horse riding, jousting, sword fighting, um, all these different stunts, I had to learn those as I was kind of meeting God and learning about the Bible, and the stories went hand in hand. So I would, I would read these stories about battles in the Bible, about Joshua, you know, meeting the angel of the Lord and all these great things, and then I would go to work and I would play the role of the warrior priest. He was the black and white knight, and he was, he was the only one that had the emphasis on his faith. And he had a big red cross on his tunic. And so as I was going through there, you know, I started to have supernatural stuff happen. Like you mentioned, I started to have, you know, demonic oppression at night. And I didn't know how to get rid of it, didn't know my authority or anything like that. And it was just this 10-year journey that ended in 2018 of me learning about Christianity through the eyes of medieval times, through the eyes of a knight. 
and it ended here at Skywatch so far. So that's basically in a nutshell how it got to this point. So for our audience, especially around the world that doesn't know about this venue, <clears throat> Medieval Nights is a themed restaurant that has an actual field of battle that while you are um, in, a, you come in, they give you a tunic, they dress you for the role as uh, a spectator in what would have been the times of King Arthur, what would have been the times of the medieval knights. And uh, you eat with your hands, there's not utensils, you're given this huge uh, turkey leg, which you are going to sit there and chomp on as if you're one of the very fat Greek or Roman uh, gluttons, and you're you're eating with your hands. I took my sales team from AT and T there, bought the whole place out, and so everybody there was a part of my sales team, and uh, this was a team building kind of thing. It was just a, it was a reward for having an accomplishment, but it was also a team building thing to say, okay, and I wasn't a believer then. I was still in the Jewish world. Uh, you're going to cast off the trappings of the present. We're going to go back in time and you're going to experience this. You're going to be entertained. You're going to watch a jousting. You're going to have to try to figure out, is this studio wrestling? Is this just an act? Is this just, you're going to have to examine. And then we went back and we actually applied some of the principles. Who are you? Who did you identify with? Did you identify with the with the Black Knight? Did you identify with the Dark Knight? Did you, it wasn't a religious experience. It was who you were to be in the marketplace. Uh, are you going to be the one that's fighting for right and for justice and to champion a cause of good business dealings and good business practices? And I, I, I glean from it good sales principles and good customer relations kind of principles. You, on the other hand, gleaned Christian lessons and began to tie into this narrative who we're supposed to be as this warrior priest. And, you know, this royal priesthood, uh, and I just wrote the foreword for Michael Lake's new book, The Kingdom Priesthood. Uh, and your, your book is, is, a, is almost like a launch pad into his book because he takes you deeper into this priesthood model as this kingdom of priests. And so from a foundational perspective, you had to come to grips with some of the battle strategies of the Bible and the characters and to understand that there has been the presence of evil in every generation that's manifest itself in modern day icons. So here you are, you're role playing, but you're role playing in such a way that you are in a battle with the dark night. As you began to see this unfold, how much did this seal for you the true meaning in the Bible of how you could be a royal line of Judah, priest, a line of Levi? How could you become this supernaturally merged DNA to rise above the battlefield and champion a cause of right, of just, of Jesus while you were there and how did that play out in your personality and your relationship with other cast members? Well when you think about you know playing the role of a knight of course you have the sword fighting the horse riding but what a lot of people don't realize is you also have the charity events you also have the the events where you go to a, maybe a children's hospital where you go to a disabled children's school and you perform for them and, and you are always to uphold the appearance of a knight. You're always to behave as a knight would have behaved. You know, you always have to have honor. You always have to have these things. So there's that aspect too. So as I was as I was portraying that role 10 years as my job, I would learn that those principles were actually in the Bible. This is the way you are to behave, you know, regardless of your profession. So I would have real life examples of these things. And when it came to mixing with the other knights, you know, off the stage, off out of the arena, not everybody was Christian, 
you know, but, but at, the, at one time, my assistant manager, he was Christian, and we actually started a Bible study. And I was actually able to leave, for years, leave my Bible out um, in the break areas and stuff like that. And just I was able to leave it out because a lot of the Christians went to church. So I was able to witness. I was able to pray for people for injuries. I was able to, um, one of the things I, I really was, was blessed to be able to do is because I knew I was a Christian and I knew my father would protect me, I was able to put myself in the role of riding the more dangerous horses. Let's say there was a new horse that had to be put in the show and he wasn't really trusting yet. <clears throat> I would be able to put myself on that horse because I know my father would protect me. I don't know the same for you know, you know, a group of non-believers. Now, as you know, when you're becoming a Christian, you're not perfect. You stumble nonstop. So I was stumbling nonstop on my way to kind of figure out what it meant to be a Christian. And I was with a bunch of uh, half guys who were Christian, half guys who weren't at one point, and then slowly they started to drop away. Then it was just a bunch of people, non-Christian, that I have to be a witness to. And when I got put in a position of leadership, I became the assistant. I was being watched with a microscope, and I made many mistakes, but not only mistakes as a, a new leader, but also as a new Christian. So I was being you know, called out on a lot of stuff, but I had to maintain, I had to decide, am I a Christian all the time or am I a Christian at home? And, and at work, I'm just one of the guys. And that kind of made me alienated. And I was fine with that, but I became known. I found out later, my wife told me because she heard about me. She's like, yeah, everyone said, oh, that's the Christian night. He's, he's weird. He, 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 he prays in the parking lot, does weird stuff like that. And no, it, he doesn't really talk to anybody because I kind of kept to myself. I didn't want to mix in. You know, there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of female presence there, and, and females are always coming up to you after the show as as the night they want to meet their knight, and it's the it's the fantasy, uh, you know, the knight in shining armor motif. But for me, it's like I was seeing in the Bible how you don't you don't go with these these women, and it just it was just this whole battle nonstop through ten years. But it was a great time to witness, and it was a great time to really draw the line in the sand and say, when does my Christianity stop? Does it stop when I come to work, or am I going to be a Christian all the time, even if I'm failing? You met Bree, who was also a part of the troupe that uh, performed at uh, this venue. How did that come about, and what was it that uh, brought you two together? Well, she worked in hospitality and serving. So as I was up at the, the bar after the show, because we'd all go up and meet, meet the audience, um, I'd be sitting there, and she would be wiping the tables down and just closing up for the night. <clears throat> And I think I said, honestly, I think I said some smart aleck comment to her, just having fun, um, just being friendly. But then we struck up a conversation, and as I got to know her, I found out she was raised in, you know, the Calvary Chapel community, and she she knew a lot about the Bible. And I think at that time, she wasn't really keeping up with it. So I, I was kind of shocked. I, as I talked to her a couple times, I was like, "Hold on, you you know so much about the Bible and biblical truths. Why are you like? What are you doing? Why why are you not, you know, going after this full force?" And she had her own struggles. And at that time, she was having a hard time with the Lord. And it it, <clears throat> it became a time of me talking to her, being like, "Hey, you know more most than you know more than most people about the Lord, and it's being wasted with you doing nothing about it." So basically, she she got right back with the Lord. And over time, over the next however many months, we became became an item. And as God was telling us, he was telling me and her separately, but I found that out later. He was telling us, you know, move to Missouri. Something's in Missouri. He, everywhere I would look, it would be Missouri. I had no idea. And I was so used to walking in faith because as a knight, I have to trust that I'm not going to get hurt when I'm jumping off a horse full speed. You know, I could trust my training to a point. Just like it says, uh, you could prepare the horse for the day of battle, but victory lies in the Lord. I found that out firsthand. I could prepare my horse, I could tighten my saddle, I could get my girth strap good, but ultimately, if I'm going to fall, I'm going to fall unless the Lord helps me. So once I found out the Lord was making it clear to move to Missouri, I knew I wasn't going to you know, live with a woman I wasn't married to. I wasn't going to take a woman I wasn't married to. So I was like, hey, we need to get married. And we got married. It was That's a very shortened version, but we moved out to Missouri and uh, maybe two years later ended up at Skywatch. But it's this whole journey, and you, you could see how, you know, verses would apply differently to me being in that battle context, because I could see a real-life example of it. There's a, and, 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 and I'm going back in my mind almost uh, 40 years uh, to thinking about this. Uh, they were called wench 
Uh, mm -hmm. you, you wanted, if you were in the audience and you wanted more ale, uh, they told you, they prepped you, they prepped the audience. There was kind of, uh, uh, you gathered together and they prepped you. And they said, if you want something, you call for wench, bring me more ale. It was that kind of, you're going to go back and you too, the audience role plays with the characters. You're just not spectators. You're actually taking on the role of the audience and you're, and that's kind of a demeaning kind of uh, statement, wench. Uh, so you had to be exposed to some of that of being able to witness what the human condition was and <clears throat> you know, I don't know the faith of my team. Uh, I was Jewish. Uh, we, we tend not to care about anybody else's faith. Uh, we don't have faith discussions. We don't talk to you about you being a Christian. Uh, if we don't see you in synagogue, we don't talk to you at all, <laughs> basically. Uh, so, you know, this idea of calling somebody went didn't, today it would bother me. Today as a believer, uh, that would bother me to enter any venue that would demean women uh, even if I'm role-playing, uh, to even let those words part, part my list. Here, Brie is in this role where she's called Wench. Wench, bring me this, and Wench, do this. And So how did, how did you, to, because you were immersed in this, this um, foot in two camps. Mm -hmm. uh, you were professionally had your foot in the world, and you personally had your foot in the kingdom and you had to play a role. And that's really the Christian walk, is that you've got to play a role, uh, wear a mask to go along to get along. And here you're having to do it professionally. You get paid to do this, but yet there had to be things which kind of rubbed you the wrong way, mm -hmm. uh, which graded against your uh, sense of chivalry. Uh, chivalry doesn't allow for a woman to be demeaned, even even the lowest of them. Uh, Jesus didn't allow women to be demeaned, even the lowest of them. Uh, so how did you begin to reconcile these things? How Did you feel a stirring in you that this was, uh, in the natural, the spiritual battleground of seeing the darkness ever creeping darkness, move into the dialogue, to the narrative, that you're actually playing a part in a very dark story uh, of good versus evil, while evil was still advancing uh, in the audience. Because the audience wasn't being sanctified, the audience wasn't being justified, they were actually told, way into it. Take your, take your, your ale mug and bang it on the table all right, calling wench refills, and you were supposed to get into it. Um, I can imagine uh, today I wouldn't even go there. All right, I just wouldn't even support such an agenda. But um, it's like the Hooters kind of thing. I, I would never be found in the Hooters. Anything that demeans women, I'm not going to be associated with. How, how did you navigate that? Because this requires, even as a young believer, this requires a moral code which cannot be violated. And you had to walk a very fine line to be able to not take offense, but to use it as an opportunity to witness. Yes. Yeah, so there were, there are many things that, you know, kind of went against my, my morals over the years that I had to take a stand for. One of the ways to mitigate some of that was to put myself in the role of the warrior priest instead of playing one of the other characters. So I, I, I was playing the role that was the most honorable, so it was easy for me to keep at least my behavior in line with that. So that, that aspect was taken care of. But when it came to other things, like um, there was one time, there was one period where for as an exercise program, they, they brought in yoga. And as a new believer, you know, I, I went along with it for a while. Then I started to realize, wait, this is, yoga is a, is a Hindu spiritual practice. And I was like, you know what, I, I'm not going to do yoga anymore. So they're like, but we're all doing it as a group. And I was like, I, I can't do it. I'm not doing it. 
And so that they provided another option for me, but I remember just people being like, you're so ridiculous, Drew. Like, what do you think spirits are gonna wrap around you every time you do yoga? And I'm like, it doesn't matter what, what happens in that realm as much as I know that this is a different religion. And all through the Bible, you see God saying, you shall have no other gods before me. And if this is a Hindu spiritual practice, what, what do I have to do with it? So there were several things like that. And then towards the end, the story ended up changing with the script, the new script, and I actually got out before this show got put in. But where, where the woman was the dominant role, and it, was, it almost sounded feministic, and then the, um, the warrior priest was the bad guy for a while. And it just got to a point where I'm like, you know what, Brie, like, it's about time. Got, like, God's putting it on my heart. I've, I've, I've done everything to do here that I feel like God wanted me to do. Because before I, I knew God was calling me out of there, I thought this was my career path. I thought I was being groomed to be a head knight in another castle. So the, either in Georgia or wherever they would have sent me. But it just, God just kind of took, took the joy out of it for me. He just let it dry up. And then he started to show me things that I was blind to over the years. He started to show me how things were really run with certain aspects. And I was like, wait a minute, I, this, isn't, this isn't something I'm okay with. And sh it was a short time of that. God kind of dried up the well. And then I got out of there. But there were several things along the road where I'm just like, man, I'm not going to do this. I can't do this. And that furthered me being this outcast kind of person. And that, coupled with being a new believer, like I said, who was making mistakes all the time, because I don't want to paint this picture like I was some perfect knight, you know, the whole time there. No, I was, I was, I went through struggles as a Christian just like everyone else did. And mine were magnified because I was in a leadership role. So, you know, it, there's times where I had to choose to take a stand. Am I going to go with what my convictions are or am I going to go with what the company wants? And ultimately, I went with what my convictions were. Well, that's, <clears throat> that's the real test that all of us have to face. And uh, even as a young believer, uh, you certainly erred on the side of the Lord as opposed to being a man pleaser. You chose to be a God pleaser. And it brought you a wife who also was equally as committed to that. So uh, it's, it's kind of an interesting study about how things in the world, if we use a biblical lens to examine them, can reveal supernatural truths to us that gird us up, even in our unlearned state. This was the, the, the tagline for, for Peter, that he was an unlearned man. Well, that just meant he didn't study with a rabbi. It didn't mean he was stupid. It didn't mean he was a member of the deadliest catch. He was a drunk and had no teeth. Uh, it just meant that he had never formally had an education sitting with a rabbi. Uh, he knew lots of things, including how to recognize the Messiah and answer the call. Uh, and so uh, young, impressionable, uh, navigating a career and navigating your faith simultaneously uh, is challenging enough, but you erred on the side of the Lord and he orchestrated your steps. We're talking with Drew Graffia, author of the book, The Warrior Priest Mindset, a necessary dichotomy for God's chosen knights. Uh, we serve a Messiah who came as a suffering servant, but returns as Yeshua ben David the conquering king. He came riding on a donkey, but the king is ready for battle, rode on a horse. We see that with Pharaoh. He came on a horse uh, and a chariot and came ready for battle. Uh, are there more things in the Bible that we could understand better if we had this warrior priest mindset that would equip us for a deeper understanding of not just natural warfare, but spiritual warfare and the plans of the enemy and the strategy of the enemy and how to become a victorious knight in the kingdom of God. This is the message of Drew Graffia and the message of the book, The Warrior Priest Mindset. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about these dual messiahs, this, this uh, prophecy of, a, of a Yeshua ben Yosef, Yeshua ben David, uh, why the suffering, why the conquering, how that parallels our own journey uh, from suffering into conquering. 
some of the codes of chivalry which Drew was exposed to that he was able to apply to a biblical model and much more. We'll cover right after this break. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, host of Revealing the Truth, Revealing the Bible, and Revealing Prophecy, seen every week on the Igniting Nation Broadcasting Network. Our daily on-demand programming is available on our Apple and Android apps and on Roku. Apple TV, Amazon Fire, and Android TV. We broadcast live Monday through Friday through our apps on our website, IgnitingNation.com, and on Facebook Live. You can listen daily on our audio platforms on Spotify, iTunes, TuneIn, and iHeart. Our lineup of best-selling authors bring you the most in-depth biblical insights into the most pressing issues of our time, including prophecy, Israel, spiritual warfare, and a wide variety of contemporary Christian issues impacting the body of Messiah around the globe. If you missed the live show, you can always catch up on the Igniting Nation YouTube channel. Follow us on social media and join us as we endeavor to heal the nations with the Word of God. With today's smartphone technology, news, information, sports, and entertainment, is widely available and almost unbounded. But what about the information that believers in Yeshua are looking for? Well, now there's an app for that. Igniting a Nation now has apps available for Android and iPhone. With our app, you'll gain access to everything you would in our website, from our featured guests to our live streaming shows. Visit Google Play or the Apple Store and download Igniting a Nation's new app today. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, inviting you to study right by my side through the Biblical Truth Library. Imagine having access to over 1,000 hours of audio and video teachings available to you through our website on a subscription basis or via our Apple and Android apps on an a la carte basis. Whichever method you choose, we promise to deliver new insights into the living Word of God as seen through the eyes of a Jewish believer. If you hunger and thirst like millions around the world for a deeper walk with God and the revelation of new understanding of the scriptures, visit IgnitingNation.com and click on the Biblical Truth Library or on any device with our free app. Don't let another day go by without receiving your heart's desire for a new depth of understanding into all of God's Word. Igniting a Nation is expanding across the globe and healing the nations with the Word of God. As we expand our television ministry, we have added new Apple and Android apps, along with new streaming platforms including Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire, Spotify, iTunes, iHeartRadio, and TuneIn Radio. Your support keeps us broadcasting live interviews and teachings to cover every challenge facing a believer in these perilous yet prophetic times. In appreciation for your support, we are offering you a special gift. For any donation of $100 or more, we will send you a signed copy of Rabbi Eric Walker's best-selling biblical thriller, The Codist, and The Seven Laws of Abundant Living. You can give online via IgnitingANation.com or by check mailed to Igniting a Nation, 115 Brook Highland Cove, Birmingham, Alabama, 35242. Make sure to claim your special offer, IAN 2020. Help us keep reaching the uttermost corners of the earth with the good news of Messiah. Hello, and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Drew Graffia, author of the new book, The Warrior Priest Mindset, A Necessary Dichotomy for God's Chosen Knights. Drew, welcome back. Glad to be back. Drew, take us into the book a little bit. Um, you have this worldly experience with a supernatural undertone. And you've been able to articulate it in the form of a book, taking us on a journey into the warrior priest mindset. Okay? How do we put on this helmet, uh, the, the exchange, and I will tell you it's transactional. Uh, you have the priest. And the priest has a mitre on his head, and you exchange that mitre for a helmet of salvation. He has a breastplate with 12 
stones on it. And he exchanges for the armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness. He has the very first thing he puts on is his belt because otherwise his pants are going to fall down. Uh, so he wraps it all together and that's what, it's not an accessory, it's an important item. The, the first thing he does is put on the belt uh, of truth. Uh, when we begin to think about the battle gear, the battle garments of armor, we begin to see that they are on par a direct transactional exchange for one priestly garment for one battle garment. And all the way through to the shin guards, to the, to, the, to the boots on your feet, to the sword in your hand, all those things are the priestly garments exchanged for the warrior garments. This is very much you going from your street clothes into your night clothes and then taking off your night clothes and putting on your priestly garments. So you're transactionally moving from the world into the fantasy, then into the reality, and that's something that uh, uh, people don't really understand, the dynamic shift, and you, <clears throat> we had a model back in the 70s, dress for success. In the kingdom, we also have a motto called dress for success. Uh, how do you mm -hmm. win the spiritual battle if you don't put on the right clothes? All right. Exactly. Uh, you don't go naked into battle. So how did you weave this in together to begin with the warrior priest mindset? Where does that start? How do I put on the mind of Messiah, who was not a champion of war, but yet was a champion of victory against an enemy? who was at war with the body of Messiah. So when you think of the two armor sets, and I, I delve deeply into the, the armor of God in the book, but when you think of those armor sets, I would argue that those are both battle armor sets. Now, the armor of God, you think of that in more of a physical battle, more of your day-to-day -day life, but it's it works spiritually. When you think of the priestly garments, those are for spiritual warfare as well. Those are for, it's a different kind of spiritual warfare. It's because you're you're praising, you're worshiping, you're you're tending to God, you're you're showing Him reverence. By doing that, you're denying the other gods. It's like when you're in a marriage, you you choose your wife and you say no to all the others. It's not just you choose yours and you you don't deal with them. You say no to them. Now, by doing that in your priestly garments, acting as a priest, you're lowering the influence of the principalities, powers rulers of darkness, everything from Ephesians 6, 12, you're lowering their influence. And when you speak out as a priest, when you teach as a priest, what you're doing is you're, you're destroying their propaganda. So it's a different battle set. It's for a different part of war. But they're both meant for battle. You know, and, and, and just like this is why the knight is so important, because you cannot divorce the knight from his spiritual side. You picture the knight kneeling down on the sword, praying before battle, and then, of course, you picture him on the horse with the helmet on fighting. You can't separate the two, and that's how we should be. And then when you look at several people throughout the Bible, one of my favorites of all time is Joshua. He acted in a priestly capacity for his people. And if you, if you look at him, when he was with Moses, they went into the tent of meeting. Moses left, and Joshua stayed behind. So he stayed behind with who I believe was the angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate Jesus in the tent. He stayed with him longer than Moses. So he was face to face with the Lord. That's very priestly. And then he went out and fought his battles, you know, conquering the remnants of the Nephilim tribes, taking back the promised land, you know, but and right before his big physical battle, right before Jericho, the first start of his conquest, who did he meet with? The angel of the Lord. He met with him. That That is, he was on holy ground. He said, take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. So you, you can't separate that from Joshua either. He wasn't just this this hero. Now, when you look at somebody else, you look at Samson. Samson is what I would call a counterfeit warrior almost, because he had everything. He was set up to be this this holy warrior as well. As well, he was he had a Nazarite vow. He wasn't to touch alcohol. He wasn't to cut his hair. He had a calling on his life. But what he did is he focused only on the warrior side, and he became a corrupt version of it. A lot of stuff he did was used by God to destroy the Philistines, but it was done in revenge. It was done in in a, in a, a, a mindset of vengeance. Now, he kept giving into his lust. 
he kept going the way of the barbarian basically and it just it corrupted his calling and, and it ended with him still doing what god wanted him to do but in a very tragic way you know he gets he gets his eyes pulled out and he has to kill himself in a sacrificial act but i think he would have had a much different trajectory of his life had he focused on that priestly side had he remembered hey you don't live for this world all these women you want to marry all these all this alcohol you want to consume, you aren't supposed to do that. You are one of my warriors. You're my judge. You're my guardian. And that that's basically a, a warrior priest gone astray, if you look at Samson. And when you look at Joshua, he's the ideal. I mean, Jesus is the ideal, but earthly-wise, Joshua is, is, man, he's up there. You know, when you take a look at uh, <clears throat> what we might consider to be a, motor, a modern code of chivalry, of Jesus. Uh, he was honoring of women uh, who had no place in first century Jewish world. Uh, he actually gave audience to those which we were forbidden, the Samaritan woman. She was a half breed. She was to not be, she was to be shunned. And yet he gave personal audience to her and listened to her. I think of code of honor as to uh, this, this act of chivalry of, uh, and, and who were the chival sh chivalrous ones in the Bible? They were the, the um, uh, you have uh, uh, Boaz who was chivalrous. You, you have uh, even King Solomon, to uh, uh, in a certain regard, was had a, had a code of chivalry. Uh, this is something that was replicated in uh, these knights of the Round Table uh, that were serving the queen, serving the king. Uh, even the process of knighthood uh, requires that you be chivalrous, uh, and the. Uh, kneeling down, the lowering your head, not making eye contact, uh, takes us to that same picture of Moses who was told to hide in the cleft of the rock so that he didn't make eye contact uh, with God. It's, it's replicated. There are undertones and overshadowings of ancient biblical truth in some of these ceremonies. So how do we reconcile uh, what's going on today? And that is the body of believers is so fractured in uh, the uh, object of, uh, objectification of women, uh, the lack of, uh, people say that, you know, there's, there's no good guys left, there's no honorable men left, there, uh, filled with lust, filled with desires. They're, they're, a Christian man's no different than a non-Christian man. Uh, everybody's searching for their Boaz and um, <clears throat> uh, looking for that attribute. Uh, but that is just a modeling of Jesus. That's not a modeling of, of Boaz, a modeling of Joshua. That's a modeling of Jesus. Uh, how do we how do we reconcile those two, and still maintain this dominion mandate given to us, where we have authority, we have dominion, we have this power uh, over darkness, uh, and we are to be a warrior, but we're not supposed to be so enamored with our role or our title that we actually lord it over others. And that's a, that's a battlefield of its own, isn't it? It really is, and and that's why in the book in the book I go into the counterfeit versions of each of each of these aspects. So, you know, a counterfeit lion, a counterfeit lamb, a counterfeit warrior, and priest, because you can get into perverted versions. So when you think of a priest, you know, devoted to scripture, disciplined, long suffering. If if you become too self righteous, you know, you become self serving. You start twisting scripture. It's a little convenient to twist it to fit what you need because it's a little easier than fixing your sin. You know, then then you go into what I call the order of the tinkling symbol. It's this, it's lovelessness, basically. I'll sum it up like that. It's, you're, if you're doing anything without love, you are a counterfeit priest. 
you are the you you might as well just be a non-believer because you'll do less damage that way. But when it comes to what's going on today, Western Christianity, it's almost like comfort is king. Like nobody wants to step outside their comfort zone and stand up for things. And another thing is this defeatist mindset. People think, oh, you know, st- like child sex trafficking, it's so rampant, we'll never stop it. Or, you know, all the stuff, all the riots going on, oh, we, we're, we're not going to stop it. it. It's this mindset that people have of just like, it's too, it's too far gone, let's just wait until Jesus comes and scoops us up. And that is a horrible soldier of God, a, a knight of Yahweh's army. Because what if Gideon, when, when the Lord cut his army down to 300 men, what if he decided not to fight because the odds were too overwhelming? You know, look at David. When David numbered his army, when the Lord told him, you know, don't worry about that, I got that covered, he, he's like, let me just double check the numbers, make sure I have enough. The Lord got very upset with him for that because he's relying on himself. So when you see this uphill battle, you see these mountains, these humongous mountains such as child sex trafficking and these, these undefeatable foes such as Goliath, you know, you see these things. And if you start looking at those circumstances or looking at how you can wrap your head around it, you, you're just going to you're just going to tap out. You're just going to give up. Oh, it, it can't be done. I can't I can't defeat this giant. Number one, if the Lord wants you to, you will. Number two, you fight until you're called out. You don't sit there and wait for the, for the bus to come and take you to heaven. You fight and fight and fight because if your life is bought and paid for and you do serve a king, what, what would a king think if he came back and saw one of his knights sitting down while everyone else was fighting? And he's just like, hey, I didn't think we could win. And it's like it's not about winning. It's about fighting. It's about pushing back the forces of darkness as much as you can because that's your job. You let the Lord worry about you know, where it's going to end up and where it's going to go. You just keep fighting. And a lot of people in Western Christianity, they're just so content with, with you know, their comforts. And, yeah, I'm a Christian. They're a Christian at the safety of their own home. But when it comes up to standing for something, it, they don't want to do it. And that's why you, you think of this code of chivalry. And I'm not talking about the, the actual literal code of chivalry. I'm talking about the, the fantasy version of it. What, what, the, what the normal person thinks of as a code of chivalry, this, this set of rules and guidelines to, to live an honorable life as a knight. Now, within that code of chivalry, there's warrior traits, there's, warrior traits, there's priest traits. So you have persever- perseverance and resilience. That's for a warrior. You know, perseverance, pushing through these battles I was just talking about. Resilience, taking wave after wave of punishment with your armor of God on and just realizing you are in a fight. You are going to get hit. This is part of it. Now, when you think of the priest side of the code of chivalry, you think of faith and fear of the Lord. You have faith. You have faith that he's going to protect you. He's going to pull you through. And if, at, if you get defeated for some reason, you're not really defeated. But if you get defeated on this earth, it doesn't matter. You kept fighting. And it all starts with fear of the Lord because you have to respect him and fear him. You have to have honor for your king, just like a knight. You have to respect your king more than anything and do his commands and, and fear his, his punishment more than you fear the punishment of your enemies. And that's what it all comes down to. That's why the knight is the perfect example for all of this. We're admonished in the Bible so often that um, uh, friendship with the world is hatred towards God. That the commitment to a higher standard, which is, should be applied to a believer, uh, has been so watered down that you, you no longer can tell the knights from the common man. Uh, during this period of time in which you portrayed as an actor uh, a pre uh, a, uh, uh, a knight uh, a knight dressed this way and wore a particular sash ribbon uh, even to this day um, Anthony Hopkins, Sir Anthony Hopkins, wears something which distinguishes him as uh, having been knighted, uh, even in his title, Sir Anthony Hopkins. He has been knighted by the Queen of England. Uh, you know, not that he is an example of, of uh, I, I don't know what his faith is, but he certainly plays some ominous roles. Uh, but we no longer can see by somebody's outfit. Even a white collar no longer connotes a person set apart because we know of the things that have been done in the name of the cloth uh, which have been perpetrated against mankind. So how do I become someone who 
has this light, this armor that is palpable, that's noticeable? How can I live a life set apart that actually is demonstrated in the marketplace, is actually recognized in the world? Not because I'm standing on a street corner with a bullhorn and I have signs that say, repent for Jesus is coming, die or you're gonna go to hell. Uh, I'm not that guy. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. not going to do that. Uh, you're not that guy. You're not going to do that. Uh, but how do we carry ourselves in such a way? How do we are? How do we become the living expression of this code of chivalry that Jesus established for us to live by, where we actually can be in the world and be recognized in the world as someone who's not of the world and provoke others to envy. Uh, let your good Lord works, uh, let man see your good works so that uh, man, let your light so shine that man would see your good works and bring glory to your Father in heaven. How do we apply that in today's world? Fast forward it from the medieval times to today, how do we have this warrior priest mindset and have it be applied. I can have that mind. That's one thing that I think it up here, mm -hmm. but I can't just be a hearer of the word. I can't just be a thinker of the word. I must be a doer of the word. How do I live out that life as this knight in shining armor who is making a difference, who is set apart, who is recognized as being the, oh, he's the Christian knight, oh, he's the, you know, what can we do today to provoke others? Well, just like I was outcast and I was known as a Christian knight, the reason why I was is because my sash, my badge of honor, the thing that, that set me apart as a Christian were my deeds, were my actions. Whether or not I did them perfectly or not doesn't matter. The way that you will see, just like you said, a white collar doesn't denote a, a priestly man anymore because you just don't know anymore. Your actions are your outfit now. Your actions are the light that's shining. So how do you go about that? How do you start? I'm all about practical advice and practical application because without that, just like you said, you're just a hearer, a doer of the word. I could read all the theological books in the world and just keep it all in my head and it does nothing for the kingdom. The Lord doesn't care how much you know. So... The way you do that, the perfect example right here is to start at home. How are you acting towards your kids? How are you acting towards your wife? What are you letting in your home? What kind of what kind of entertainment are you watching? You know, are you watching stuff with with nudity? Are you watching excessive, you know, excessively violent and gory things? Well, like, what kind of things are you doing? Because that's what you're putting into your body. Now, how do you treat your neighbor, like your literal neighbor, like next door? You know, are you impatient with your wife? You have to start with with the little things before you can tackle the big things. And so many people just forget their home life, forget their their day-to-day -day life, and they think they're going to be a Christian when this big moment arrives, when the Lord shows up and says, here's your test to be a Christian. Um, are you going to do this for me? That doesn't happen. The, the way that that goes about is every single day those little things come up. And you have to be a Christian every single day, not when it's comfortable, not when it's easy, not when no one's looking. Because that integrity is what you do when, when no one's looking. So at your home is where you could start with this warrior priest mindset. But also when you're out in the world, what are you doing? You know, there's people that, you know, that they see a homeless person and, and they're just like, oh, I don't want to give money because I don't know what's going to do with that or what they're going to do with the money, basically. And I would say if you have discernment, you know, you have, you have discernment about giving money to a person you feel like you should and that's one thing. But, it, but it's not up to you to wonder what's going to happen after you do it. You know, one way you can act like Jesus is go give to the poor right away. The Lord knows your heart, you know. So it's just these things that people that that's sitting there right for them. You know, are you being are you giving? Here's a big way: money. What you do with your money, because people think, oh, I, I'm not going to go out there and fight these things. It's like, okay, but but you have money, and and you can go provide for those people that fight those things. You could be the hand while someone else is the foot, basically. So you could put your money in the ministries who are on the front lines, ministries who are fighting, you know, SRA, like Russ Dizdar, satanic ritual abuse, you know, fighting sex trafficking, fighting fighting all these things, you know. You can put money into those areas, and that could benefit the kingdom. So there's several different ways, but people are just waiting for this big miraculous moment where the Lord shows up and says, "Here's your here's your test. You do this one thing, and this will prove it to me." And it doesn't work that way. So it's based on 
every day, small things, small moves, small, small actions that start to build a portfolio of, uh, of uh, things you're doing for the kingdom, uh, things you're doing in private, uh, your prayer life, your home life, your community life, your personal life, and your representation of having this warrior priest mindset that says that I'm going to process mentally as both a warrior fighting the present darkness, but as a priest ministering to others in such a way that I'm bringing honor. I, the, the, the words of Paul come just pouring out of my mouth, let no unwholesome talk come from your mouth, but only that which is for the encouragement and the uplifting of another. And for those within its hearing, he's saying this is to be a public conversation. There are people to hear how you are engaging that person. We have these encounters in Walmart, where Walmart is the greatest opportunity for you to encounter every walk of life, every faith, every national origin, every race, every religion, every creed, and how you treat and how you help and how you act. And if you're so committed to social distancing that you wouldn't help an older woman uh, with a heavy object and you're more concerned about this act of kindness, oh, I'm not going to do that act of kindness because I might expose myself to COVID-19. Is the Lord really going to honor that or do you believe in the hedge of protection that God's put around you to say, I've called you to be this night. I've called you to be this warrior, priest, minister to another and to have this code of honor, which is not a medieval code. It's a biblical code and it's one exactly. in which he's given you. Uh, we've been talking with uh, Drew Graffia, the warrior priest mindset, a necessary dichotomy for God's chosen knights. There's many of you are struggling. How do I live a life where I want to bring honor and glory to God, but I just don't have the mind of God? What if the mind of God was a little bit different than what you thought it is? What if the mind of God was a dichotomy? The mind of God equipped you to both be a warrior and a priest. What if you were called to be both, and you were called to be both in all circumstances as you fight the battles at home, as you fight the battles in the street, as you fight the battles in the heavenlies, that you can be both knight and priest and not be schizophrenic, not, be, <laughs> not suffer from multiple dis, uh, personality disorders, that you can actually have that mindset and you can read a book that's not only entertaining, but it's also truly scripturally based, biblically sound, and will excite you about the calling that's on your life. Drew Graffia answered that call. It brought him a new wife, a new life, and now he is living the dream that God had given him when he was learning to ride a horse that he wanted to do something more for the kingdom, and now he's joined the Skywatch TV team. It is a great read, and I strongly suggest you get it. If you're looking for it, just go to IgnitingNation.com. Go to today's broadcast calendar. You're going to see Drew's name. You're going to see a picture of the book. It's going to say the words, love the interview, buy the book, click right there. It'll get you a copy. Drew Graffia, thank you for sharing this story with us here on Revealing the Truth. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure to be here. God bless you. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.